Hello all. Today we will be studying about the microbial ecology in soil. This will focus on interactions between the soil organisms. Now before we get into the different types of interactions that occur in soil, let us first review a few important terminologies. Ecology as we all know is the study of interactions among organisms and their environment. This includes interactions that organisms have with each other and with their abiotic or physical factors that are present around them. Microecology is ecological study which is done with respect to microorganisms. Now when we have many numbers of organisms of a particular species we call that as a population. A biotope is the site of habitation of a population or the place where the population resides is known as the biotope. Microbiocenosis is the collection of populations of different species of organisms which are dwelling together or living together in a particular biotope. So if I give a biotope such as the oral cavity, in the oral cavity there will be populations of different species which are residing together in the same habitat or in the same biotope. This collection or this assemblage or association is known as microbiocenosis. When there are populations that are metabolically related, they constitute a guild. So, guild includes populations of different species of organisms that have some metabolical or they are metabolically related. Now, in this diagram, you can see that population is the collection of a number of organisms of the same species that is known as a population. In a water body, which is shown over here, there are different communities. These communities are called as microbiocenosis. So, in community 1, the biotope or the site of habitat is the photic zone. In the photic zone or in the zone which has light in it, we have different populations residing together like cyanobacteria and other algae. These are different populations. Hence, this entire community is called as a microbiocenosis or we have another microbiocenosis which is community 2 wherein we have the oxic zone. In the oxic zone or wherever there is oxygen present, we have all sorts of chemoorganotrophic bacteria. This is the second microbiocenosis. Now if we see microbiocenosis 3 or community 3, this is the anoxic zone. Anoxic zone is where there is no oxygen penetration at all. In such a zone, if you can see here, there are different examples of guilds. So, I told you that guild is metabolically related populations. Now, if you see here, if you see the first guild that can be present, we have methanogenic bacteria and homoacetogenic bacteria. Both of them, both methanogens and acetogens require carbon dioxide as the source, as the carbon source, which they convert to different end products. So, methanogens converted into methane whereas acetogens converted into acetate but both of them are metabolically related because both of them require carbon dioxide as their carbon source. You can just see guild 3 we have denitrifying bacteria and ion reducing bacteria. Now denitrifying bacteria are converting nitrate to nitrogen whereas ion reducing bacteria are converting ferric to ferrous. Both of these are related metabolically or both of these form part of a guild because they require hydrogen as the electron donor. So, where we have different organisms, different populations, organisms of different species which are related metabolically. Either they are requiring the same electron donor, same electron acceptor, same carbon source, that type of population is called as the guild. So, I have just given you different examples of guild which can be found in anoxic zone or the anaerobic zone of a particular water body. Now, there are different organisms. Now, we will be focusing on interactions which are found in soil particularly. So, in soil, different organisms are living and between them, we can have different types of interactions. So, we can either have plant microbe interactions or we can have interactions between animals and microorganisms, between animal and animal, between a plant and an animal 
or between different microorganisms that are living in the soil. We will be focusing on only where microbes interact with microbes and those where plant interact with microbes. So under those associations, there are these can be broadly divided into three types. We have positive or beneficial associations, neutral or neutralism, negative or harmful associations. Let us first see what are the positive associations. So positive interactions are extremely important because they help in better survival of both communities. If I help another community to survive, both the communities are able to survive, both the populations are able to survive better. Also, it helps in effective utilization of whatever nutrients are available in the soil. If I break down something and give it to the other community, that community will take up that particular product and utilize it for its own growth. So, in this way, whatever available nutrients are there in the soil are being utilized in a better way, in a more effective way. Now, I have mentioned the term symbiosis over here because in the older texts, symbiosis is one type of positive interaction which is also called as mutualism. We will be coming to it. But in the newer texts, symbiosis is considered to be any closely associated interaction. So, both the term, both the definitions are correct. It is only based on the text that you refer. So, in some texts that you refer, you will be seeing that symbiosis is the interaction for all closely associated interactions, which is also correct. Now, the first positive interaction is commensalism. This is a one-way relationship. If you see this diagram, you can make out. It's a unilateral relationship or a one-way relationship wherein one organism is being benefited, whereas the other organism is neither benefited nor harmed. It remains unaffected. So, in commensalism, one organism will be definitely benefited. The other organism is not going to be affected at all. It remains unaffected. That is called as commensalism. An example is, when we have decomposition of a particular compound by one population into simpler substances. So, we have cellulolytic fungi like ketomium globosum which will break down cellulose into simpler molecules like it might break it down into cellobios or into glucose. That cellobios or glucose is used by other organisms for its growth. Here, cellulolytic fungi are being unaffected. They are surviving normally. So, they are breaking down cellulose as a regular part of their cycle. But the other organisms are being benefited. Or we have lignolytic fungi. Lignolytic fungi includes phenorochid chrysosporium. Lignolytic fungi are similar. They will break down the lignin into simpler substances which is being utilized by other organisms to grow. Here, the phenorochid is being unaffected whereas the other organisms are being benefited. Or we have facultative anaerobes. Facultative anaerobes will grow and utilize all the oxygen which will facilitate the growth of anaerobes. So, here facultative anaerobes are being unaffected whereas anaerobes are being positively benefited. We also have co-metabolism which is again a type of commensalism wherein some particular substrate which cannot be used at all is being made available to other organisms by commensalism. So, we have mycobacterium vacae which converts cyclohexane to cyclohexanone. Now, cyclohexanone is something that can be used by pseudomonas. So, this is co-metabolism where they are feeding each other. They are mutually feeding each other. So, this type of interaction where you have a unilateral relationship is called as commensalism. One organism is always benefited. The other organism remains unaffected. Moving on to the second type of positive interaction that is synergism or proto-cooperation. Now, this type of interaction is where both the populations are benefited, but the relationship is not obligatory. It is not compulsory. Even if I separate out both the populations, they can survive independently. This type of an interaction is called a synergism or proto-cooperation, wherein both the populations are benefited, but the relationship is not obligatory. Example is, we have nitrogen-fixing bacteria and green algae which grow in environments that are poor in nitrogen as well as organic carbon. Now, what happens over here? Nitrogen-fixing bacteria will fix the nitrogen from the atmosphere 
and convert it into a usable form which is taken up by the green algae. Green algae on the other hand will fix the carbon dioxide that is present in the atmosphere through photosynthesis and provide organic carbon that is used up by the nitrogen fixing bacteria. So here the medium was lacking in both, the environment was lacking in two components and we had both these organisms surviving together helping each other. But if you take out these organisms and put them in different environments, they will still survive. They don't need this organism, this partner to grow. Hence, it is a non-obligatory relationship. We have another example wherein we have thiobacillus feroxidans and bigerinchia. Thiobacillus feroxidans is an organism that can fix carbon dioxide. Bigerinchia is an organism that can fix nitrogen. So, when they grow together... They can grow in an environment that lacks both carbon dioxide or carbon source, organic carbon as well as nitrogen. This is just to show you the images of how bigerinchia and thiobacillus appear. The third type of interaction is mutualism. This is what I was telling you. In the older books, mutualism is also referred to as symbiosis. So, mutualism is where the both the organisms that are involved in the interaction are benefited and they require this relationship to grow or this association is obligatory. They cannot withstand the effects of the environment if they are separated out or if they are removed and put into the environment, they cannot survive because the relationship or the association is obligatory. Example, very popular example that we have is rhizobium and leguminous plants. Now in this case, rhizobium will form nodules. So, you can see over here, these are the nodules. Rhizobium will form nodules and will survive on leguminous plants. Now, the root nodules which are formed contain rhizobium which is going to fix nitrogen and provide it to the plant. The plant in turn will make sure that it provides all the organic substrates or ready-made food to rhizobium so that it can survive. Here, both need to survive with each other if taken out if they are separated, the plant or the leguminous plant cannot assimilate the nitrogen. They have to survive together. Otherwise, they will not be able to survive in a nitrogen lacking environment. Another example of a symbiotic association is lichens. So, lichen is an association between algae and fungi. If you see over here, we have the lichen which forms this type of an association. The bottommost layer and the topmost layer are made of fungal hyphae whereas the central layer is where you have the algae being present. Now the algae or the phycobiont, the phycobiont will provide oxygen, it will provide carbon and other nutrients for both the partners. The mycobiont will make sure that it is providing a stable environment, it will protect from light, from other predators, it will provide water and minerals, it will provide a substrate environmental stress will be reduced that is provided by mycobiont. So, both the partners are surviving together. If you separate them out, they cannot survive in the environment easily. Now, there are different types of symbiosis. So, we have done three types of positive interactions. Those were commensalism, synergism and symbiosis or mutualism. Now, there are two types of symbiosis, ecto and endosymbiosis. Ectosymbiosis is wherein the symbiont, that is a partner, lives on the body surface of the host. This can even include internal surfaces such as the lining of the digestive tract. So, we have ectotrophic mycorrhiza or ectomycorrhiza which we will be studying about in the future classes. Even lichens are ectosymbionts because they remain on the surface of the host. Endosymbionts, on the other hand, are symbionts which are going to penetrate the cell of the host. Now, you can see here in this diagram, this is Metopus contortus. It is a protozoan. It is a ciliated protozoan which has sulfate-reducing bacteria inside it. So, here the bacteria or the symbiont has penetrated, in, penetrated inside the cell. Hence, it is an example of endosymbiosis. Or another example is vesicular, arbuscular, mycorrhiza which is a type of an endomycorrhiza wherein the fungal hyphae will penetrate the plant roots or rhizobium which is found in the root nodules is also an example of endosymbiosis.